Thanks. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me to speak to the Logic Group. It's great to be here. Thank you especially to Marcus and to Demir particularly for organizing everything. Um, so I'm very grateful. Um, some of our actual plans were a little bit last minute, but they persevered for us. So thank you. Okay, so this is, uh, I'm going to start with the one of these usual disclaimers. So the disclaimer today is that this is the first time I've given this talk, so if it's a bit rough in places, that's why. Um, I'm happy to take questions at any point throughout the talk, uh, so just interrupt. Um, but uh, if you have maybe more substantial questions, perhaps they will get answered later on in the talk, so maybe leave them to the end. Okay, so the motivating ideas for this talk come out of things that I've been working on, I guess, for quite some time now, since, uh, since my PhD, uh, and a paper that I was writing some years ago on uh, computational reverse mathematics. Um, so this idea proposed by Richard Shaw um, that uh, instead of doing reverse mathematics in the kind of traditional sort of proof theoretic way, we should do it completely model theoretically or recursion theoretically by just looking at Turing ideals or looking at uh, Omega models of RCA0. Uh, and I was sort of critiquing this from the point of view of uh, the use of reverse mathematics to study foundations of mathematics. Um, so this, this talk is in some way uh, an evolution of those thoughts. And the motivating ideas were more or less as follows. So the first is that when we analyze these traditional foundational programs, so I'm thinking here of something like finitism, Hilbert's program, this kind of thing, or constructivism um, in the spirit of Brouwer, or as it was later developed um, throughout the 20th century uh, by Bishop and other people, um, or predicativism as it started with Poincaré and Weil, and was then um, explored by Pfefferman, Schutter, etc. So these are kind of traditional, philosophically motivated foundational programs. And when we look at them as foundations of mathematics, particularly through the lens of mathematical logic, what we want to know is something like, what mathematics can we do in these foundations? What do they get us? And what do they leave out? What's their scope? And what's their limits? And traditionally, a lot of this analysis of exactly uh, how much gets left out, how much is in, uh, this has been done from this kind of external perspective, um, from a sort of perspective of classical mathematics. So we just sort of take classical set theoretic mathematics for granted, and we work in that, and we study the foundation. We say, okay, what kinds of inferences are acceptable? What kinds of axioms are acceptable on this foundation? And therefore, uh, what are the limits of this foundation? So it's looking at this foundation from the outside in. Uh, and of course, computability theory has historically played a very important role in this study of foundations. Um, so really going back to the, uh, the late 40s, early 50s, with the work of people like Kleene, um, the idea was, let's study, say, constructivism by identifying the notion of um, a rule or algorithm with a general recursive function. So let's apply Church's thesis and say, okay, if everything has to be, you know, if, if we're generating objects through law-like processes, then those law-like processes are going to produce recursive functions. We know lots about recursive functions now, now and so we can use recursion theory, as it was then, to study, uh, to study constructivism, to study intuitionistic mathematics, and say uh, what lies outside the scope of intuitionistic mathematics. Um, but then the standard perspective of computability theory is, of course, external to, say, constructivism or to finitism or predicativism. So it has these fairly strong presuppositions built in, I mean, just as a sort of informal mathematical practice as it's carried on in an everyday way. So we think that there's some determinant standard natural number structure, and we define our recursive functions on top of that. So everything is given in terms of that natural number structure. And moreover, if we think that uh, you know, we, we produce some counterexample, we say, okay, uh, I found a theorem of classical mathematics that just isn't true in the computable sets, um, 
but you know, I'm still assuming it's true that the, I don't know, the cantor bendixson theorem or the heine borel theorem, these are just true mathematical theorems, and okay, they happen to be non-constructive, but they're still true. Um, and so we're just looking from outside, from this external perspective of computability theory, in this case, into the, the constructive world as we're modeling it through computability theory. Um, and so my thesis at the end is going to be something like reverse mathematics gives us a way of at least partially internalizing these computability theoretic results. So taking this external perspective and trying to bring it inside into the foundational perspective, the foundational standpoint, whatever that happens to be. Um, and that this is you know, some way of building a bridge between the external world of informal mathematics, of computability theory and set theory, and the internal foundational perspective. Um, so an obvious question is like, why should we care? I mean, you know, maybe we're just interested on kind of purely technical level, what the limits of these systems are, what kind of reasoning can get us where. And I suppose this is really, my motivation is really a sort of philosophical motivation. My motivation is as follows. If you want to just do analysis of how far these programs can get you, that's fine. But if you want to actually uh, have some kind of potential for dialogue, if you want to try and convince somebody who's a, you know, a finitist or a predicativist and say, look, you're missing something, there's something outside your world, then you have to have some way to communicate these results to them. You have to be able to make those impossibility results accessible to them. Um, and so I'm going to talk about how we can do this using reverse mathematics and what the, the limits of this are. Um, so what's what's necessary in order to accomplish this. Okay, so the rough outline is going to be, I'm going to talk a little bit about this foundational standpoint um, in its various incarnations. I'm going to talk a little bit about finitism as a kind of example of this, because this is where people have got a very nice worked out story um, of this internal external dichotomy. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about counterexamples in intuitionistic mathematics, because I think this provides a kind of useful template for understanding how we should approach this whole uh, project. And then I'm going to talk through a little bit of the history of recursive counterexamples and the use of computability theory in analyzing foundations. And finally, I'm going to get onto reverse mathematics and what that can tell us about foundations. Okay. So the kind of basic setup for any of these traditional foundational uh, projects is, is really just that uh, you know, it's some kind of skepticism or worry about classical mathematics and thinking that classical mathematics uh, seems very powerful, but it admits all of these methods that somehow seem kind of like they're almost magic. You know, this is like, uh, I think back to uh, Hilbert and the basis theorem, and you know, you, you have this proof that doesn't actually exhibit the objects that it's purporting to uh, uh, show exists, and, and this was very shocking to people at the time. Maybe not as shocking as, as the kind of received history has it, but still, you know, this was a, a new way of thinking, a kind of radically new way of thinking. Um, and this kind of phenomenon, coupled with uh, set theoretic paradoxes, coupled with um, what happened during the rigorization and arithmetization of analysis, made a lot of people uncomfortable, made them think maybe we need to put these uh, mathematics on a, a more secure foundation. And there were different ways of doing this. Uh, so, and the, we can kind of see this as a, a, a process that unfolded from really the middle of the 19th century onwards with um, the development of set theory, uh, with Dedekind, and then you know, these kind of um, finitist responses from people like Kronecker, and then Hilbert, Brouwer, Weil, all of these people coming up with slightly different ways to approach this problem of, of certainty in mathematics. Um, and so if you want to be really certain about something, then there's obviously going to be lots of stuff that we're at least willing to throw out because of its uncertainty. It can't be grounded in some appropriate way in the things that we're sure about. So Hilbert's finitism, for example, uh, you know, is only going to allow you to accept finitary methods, finitary proofs. So we're thinking that, that really 
the, the real stuff is these concrete or semi-concrete stroke notations, you know, for notations for natural numbers. And this is real contentful mathematics. And everything else, everything else is ideal. It's like ideal elements in algebra. They are admissible, but they're not they're not given in the intuition in the way that um, the natural numbers are. Um, and therefore, you know, we have to somehow reduce the mathematics of the infinite to the mathematics of the finite. And this is a very restricted kind of finitism. I mean, not as restricted as one can be. Uh, but still, you know, this is very limited. I talk a little bit more about the analysis of this shortly. Um, constructivism, you know, another program in a cinema of spirits. Um, so if we have some kind of existential statement, you know, say there's a, a natural number with a certain property, we have to be able to exhibit that natural number. We have to actually have some process that produces it. We can't merely say there is one. Um, because, you know, the, yeah, for reasons tied up with, yes, the law of excluded middle not being generally valid. So, um, you know, you might think that we haven't finished the process of constructing the natural numbers, let alone the real numbers. You know, this is something that kind of goes on and on this ideal process carried out in the mind of the mathematician. Um, and so if we want to uh, actually prove an existential statement, then we need to produce a witness. Uh, and then finally, predicativism. Again, the idea is that the natural numbers are somehow central. And here, it's a bit more permissive. Um, so this is really coming from Poincaré initially, and then as developed more formally, more technically by Bile. Um, the idea is that the natural number structure is somehow given in intuition, and is a sort of acceptable as a completed totality. So we can have uh, full induction, for example. But then the real numbers are somehow not given as a completed totality. So if you can define a real number by only quantifying over natural numbers, that's OK. And if you can define a real number predicatively, which is to say without vicious circles, without impredicativity, by only quantifying over those objects you've already defined that are already accepted, and this is supposed to be a kind of unfolding process where we can go higher and higher building on what we've already defined, so from the bottom up. Um, but we can't define uh, sets of natural numbers, for example, using quantifiers that range over the whole power set of the natural numbers. You know, this is an impredicative maneuver that's, that's ruled out, unless we can find some predicative alternative for defining that. Okay. So these are the kinds of foundations that I'm, I'm interested in uh, finding some kind of rapprochement with. Okay, so I'm going to kick off the little bit I'm going to say about um, the foundational standpoint by quoting from this very nice and very famous paper uh, by Bill Tate from 1981. And he says, what does it mean to say that f is a finitist function? First of all, it's clear, and he just thinks that this is somehow obvious, there's not that much in the way of argument, it's clear that this question itself has no finitist meaning, since the general notion of function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers has none, right? There's, there's no general finitist notion of a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers. Um, so if we want to ask what a finitist function is, we're necessarily doing it from an external perspective where we have a general notion of function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers, and we're saying, what are the finitest ones of these? How do we restrict our attention and find the finitest ones? And so Tate goes on to say, what we're trying to do is characterize the finitist functions and the finitist proofs from a non-finitist standpoint. We're standing outside finitism and trying to characterize it. And the characterization that Tate comes up with is that the finitist functions are the primitive recursive functions, and the finitist proofs are the proofs of primitive recursive and primitive. And 
he's very clear that this is an external characterization. This is not something that's available to the finitist. The finitist is sitting there in their little finite universe, and if you offer them a proof in PRA, they'll work through it, and there you will see that all of the defining equations of the primitive recursive functions used are in fact finitist, they're acceptable to them, and they will accept the conclusion of the proof. But they can't accept the generalization where you say, okay, you accept this finitist proof, but on the basis of these principles from primitive recursive arithmetic, and so surely, you know, I'm going to give you a schematic presentation of PRA, you can accept all of this, right? They're not going to be able to do that, at least according to Tate's analysis. Uh, that the finitist can't escape and, and uh, say, actually, no, I recognize that all of PRA is, is finitistically acceptable. Um, and this is kind of, I mean, historically, this is a point where Tate disagrees with an analysis of finitism given by Kreisel. So Kreisel says he, he doesn't accept this point of Tate, so Tate thinks that you know, Kreisel just misunderstands it somehow, or misses the point, <laughs> and that, uh, in fact, the, you know, according to Kreisel, the, predict the finitist can see that all primitive recursive arithmetic proofs are finitist, and on this basis, they can endorse a reflection principle. So if something's PRA provable, then that thing holds. And on that basis, um, they can help themselves to all of PA. Uh, so, so Tate has this much more restrictive view, and he thinks that really the, the finitist is, is um, not able to, to see from the outside that it's really, you know, this analysis of finitism is something that's only accessible to us from the outside with our general notion of a function from the natural numbers to the natural numbers and then just restricting down and saying, okay, which of these are finances? How, how can we work this out? Uh, and this is a quote from a more recent paper from 2010 by John Burgess, who's kind of reflecting on Tate's paper and on um, things that happened afterwards relating to reverse mathematics, um, mainly to do with um, conservativity programs. Um, so, it's attempt by Simpson to a partial realization of Hilbert's program. So Burgess says, from the fact, assuming that it is one, so assuming that taste is correct, the finitist provability in actual fact co coincides with the PRA provability, it does not follow that a finitist proof of the PRA provability of a result amounts to a finitist proof of the finitist provability of that result. Mm -hmm. So this is a little bit of a mouthful, but more or less the idea is that uh, that, that um, even if this identification is correct, it doesn't mean that that it thereby shows that the finitist can access this truth. Because, you know, for the inference to be valid, the coincidence of PRA provability and finitist provability or at least the inclusion of the former and the latter, would have to be not merely a fact, but a fact known to the finitist. So Burgess is really just trying to reinforce Tate's point. He's trying to say, if you want to try and get something out of these conservativity theorems, um, then you're going to run afoul of this inside-outside dichotomy that, that Tate is emphasizing. And I guess my point here is really not specifically to do with finitism, but that this is a fairly general phenomenon. That this same point applies also to different uh, flavors of constructivism. Of course, the devil, as always, is in the details here with constructivism. There are you know, as many different versions as there are constructivists, and perhaps more. Um, and also predicativism. It, you know, so I'm just really trying to make a general point about um, this distinction between an internal and external viewpoints on a foundation. So, I think a little bit of light can be shed on this by considering um, Brouwer's counterexamples. Um, so, you know, Brouwer, of course, was invested in this intuitionistic foundation of mathematics, and as a mathematician, you know, wanted to know what was intuitionistically provable and what wasn't. You know, which, which theorems are in fact false, and how do we characterize this, this standpoint, this, this intuitionistic standpoint? So, 
in general, he was concerned with this unreliability of logical principles, um, particularly the law of excluded middle, so famously held that's not generally valid. And to demonstrate the unreliability of logical laws, in particular excluded middle, he introduced these weak counterexamples. So a weak counterexample is really just uh, an unproved statement. So it's very weak. You know, it's, it's not unprovable, merely unproved. So the example I'm going to give is Goldbach's conjecture. So it's an unsolved mathematical problem. And it just states that every even integer greater than 2 is the sum of two primes. OK, so famous unsolved problem. But then, if we have an intuitionistic reading of the logical connectives, then the instance of the law of excluded middle that we get from looking at Goldbach's conjecture is either Goldbach's conjecture holds or it doesn't hold, right? That's the classical view from the intuitionistic reading. It's either we have a proof of the statement or we have a proof of its negation. That's just what disjunction is on the Brouwer, I think, or of interpretation of the uh, logical connective or. So, since this is an unsolved conjecture, right, we don't know that it's true, we don't know that it's false, um, this statement that either GC or not GC is false from the perspective of the intuitionist because you know, they think that either you have to have a proof of the one or a proof of the other, and we have neither. So therefore, the law of excluded middle is not generally valid. So this is a weak counterexample based on unsolvability, uh, sorry, based on un unsolvedness, so based on it being an outstanding problem. And I'm going to suggest later that this is a kind of, a, a one, one way in which um, we can bring impossibility results into a, a foundation, that one way can be that you have a certain attitude from a foundational standpoint towards unsolved problems. That is to say, statements that are undecided so far from that foundational standpoint. Another attitude is going to be related to uh, Brower's later work on strong counterexamples. So these, these are uh, counterexamples in the sense that they are statements which are classically true but intuitionistically false. They lead to contradiction. Um, so, for example, there's a theorem in intuitionistic analysis that all total functions from the unit interval to the reals are continuous. Uh, this depends on details of something I'm not going to go into about the intuitionistic conception of the continuum uh, as composed of these choice sequences. So, you know, if you're a mathematician and you basically you build a real by choosing natural numbers um, according to some rule or possibly not according to some rule, depending on which kind of choice sequences. So I'm not going to get into the details of this. Um, but in any case, using this theorem, you can, you can prove the, this negation. Uh, so it's not the case that all real numbers are either rationals or non-rationals, which from a classical perspective seems deeply bizarre. We just think, OK, we've got our real numbers, and we've got rationals embedded into it as a dense subset. and you know, if you look at any real number, either it's rational or it's irrational. It's kind of a basic, like one of the most basic facts. But Brouwer shows that intuitionistically, this is this is not just undecided. This is actually false, which is deeply bizarre, at least to me. Um, and so, so he shows that this classical theorem that all reals are either rational or irrational. Um, you know. The, there's a counterexample to this. Um, so this is a kind of counterexample to uh, a classical dichotomy, basically. Um, and again, I want to suggest that this gives us a sort of window on a way that um, the recursive counterexamples I'm going to be talking about next can be sort of brought into a foundation. So the first way was going to be based on um, a problem being unsolved, and this is a problem being solved in the negative. So having a principle of some kind that actually rules something out actively. Okay. So, on to computability theory at last. So, I'm going to start off with this rather long quote from a 
very nice and I guess pretty famous paper by uh, Stephen Cleaney. And it's about intuitionism and it's about computability theory. So already we have these two subjects dovetailing right at the beginning. So this whole project is, you know, in some sense already on its way and well worked out by the early 1950s. So Cleaney says, Brower defines a set as a certain kind of law by which it seems clear that he means an effective process or an algorithm. So a set, thinking of like a set of natural numbers or a set of real numbers, a set of, you know, a collection of whatever mathematical objects, you know, it's given by some kind of rule because otherwise how would you know what was in there? Um, if all of our mathematical objects have to be generated, have to be constructed by some kind of process so that any existential statement is, is witnessed by one of these constructions, then we can't just have sets as these kind of purely extensional entities floating around with you know, no idea of what might be in there. It has to be generated by, by some kind of law-like process. Um, and then Cleaney goes on to say, that according to the Church-Turing thesis, an algorithm is always represented by a general recursive function. So any kind of effectively computable process, um, this can be carried out by a Turing machine, or you know, it can be represented by a general recursive function, or a lambda definable function, or however we want to characterize the computable functions. This suggests that we attempt to identify laws or algorithms as used by Brouwer with algorithms in a sense studied in the theory of general recursive functions. So he's saying Brouwer has this informal notion of a law uh, as giving a set. Let's make this formal. Let's make it precise. Let's use recursive function theory to try and understand what's going on in intuitionism. Uh, I guess this uh, rather nice little way of saying this. So it says, if this identification is correct, then it should be possible to give a version of Brouwer's theory in which the theory of general recursive functions is used as the basis for proving or disproving propositions about sets. And this is precisely what I'm going to go on to talk about, about recursive counterexamples. Uh, but then he has this rather charming final sentence. He says, this would give a new avenue for penetrating into Brouwer's theory, which some persons, including myself, have found difficult to access. And when I read this, I thought, well, Cleaney found it hard to understand Brouwer's theory. I, I don't feel so bad that I also found it extremely difficult. <laughs> okay, so Cleaney's idea that we can identify um, the, uh, the sets in intuitionism, which are all given by laws um, with recursive functions, became known as intuitionistic church species, or ICT. So this is to claim that all total functions uh, from the natural numbers to the natural numbers are computable. Um, so at various points here, I'm going to skate over a lot of details. Uh, so if there are any scholars of intuitionism in the room, uh, my apologies. I'm, I'm trying to make a fairly general point, so I may butcher some of the details. Um, Okay, so this, this uh, thesis, ICT, gives us a powerful way of determining the limits of constructive analysis, so this method of recursive counterexamples. Um, so here's a representative quote from Fred Richman. Uh, it says, counterexamples such as Specker's bounded increasing sequence of rational numbers that's eventually bounded away from any real number may be used as Browerian counterexamples are as evidence of the unprovability of certain assertions. So here, you know, here's the idea. We use computability theory and we find these counterexamples. Um, and this, this shows that certain theorems um, which may be classically true are intuitionistically false. Um, or at any rate, if not false, then at least unprovable. Okay, so very briefly some terminology that I'm going to use throughout the rest of the talk. Um, so we can think of these uh, classical principles as, uh, as problems. So generally we're going to be thinking about statements in a certain logical form, the sort of for all exists form, um, so typically uh, pi 1, 2 statements. So we consider principles phi in L2, see if I'm sure 
We're going to consider principles in the language of second order arithmetic to be defined later. But in any case, the, the logical form is the interesting thing here. So we have a for all objects such that theta holds of them, there exists something else such that some relation rho holds between x and theta. Okay, so here we're thinking of them as problems. So this is our input, more or less. This is the solution, the output. Um, it solves the problem. So this says this is the solution. Okay. So some set of natural numbers such that theta holds of it is an instance of this phi. And given such an x, a y such that the relation rho holds between x and y is called the solution to x. Okay. So we think of the statement as a problem in general, right? It's a problem in general. We have a universal quantifier. And then we have a particular instance. Can we solve this? And can we solve it computably, which is often the question. So a recursive counterexample is precisely one where we can cook up some computable instance of this problem where every solution is non-computable. Um, so maybe worth saying at this point some examples. Um, kind of classic example that really comes out of this 1952 Pliny paper, um, but takes a long time to just state, is that uh, the completeness theorem for first order logic is uh, provides us with one of these recursive counter examples. So what's the completeness theorem say? Well, in one formulation it says, every consistent theory has a model. Okay, so it's exactly in this form. For all x, if x is a consistent theory, then there exists some y, which is a model for x. Okay. So lots of computable theories about, but then what we can do is we can cook up a particular theory which is computable. Easy enough to do that. In fact, it's kind of harder to come up with non-computable ones. Um, we can come up with a computable theory without any computable model. Uh, and I guess maybe a natural example would just be um, take PA and add a non-standard element to it. And then, of course, we're going to be guaranteed that all of the models are uh, non computable So this is a recursive counterexample. So the recursive counterexample is the computable set with no computable uh, solution to it. Okay. So another quote from somebody invested in uh, the literature on recursive counterexamples and constructive mathematics, uh, Beeson, he says, one value of recursive counterexamples is the following. If we show that a theorem fails in recursive mathematics, we can stop wasting our time trying to prove it in constructive mathematics. Um, so he's saying, in slightly punchier language, more or less what Richmond is saying, um, these recursive counterexamples can give us a guide to constructive unsolvability of problems. Um, so, unless we're willing to use some axiom which contradicts Church's thesis, by which he means intuitionistic Church's thesis, the thesis that all functions from the natural numbers to the natural numbers are computable. Um, so, this lets us apply results from computability theory in a very general way and find theorems that are unprovable in constructive mathematics, modulo this disclaimer about, well, if you're a constructivist to accept something that contradicts Church's thesis, then the game is a bit different, but uh, more or less, I guess, people are happy with some form of this Church's thesis. Okay, so, yeah, heine borel theorem is another example. Um, in some sense of, the, to be discussed later, I guess this is the same example as the completeness theorem. Uh, and then a bunch of standard statements from analysis. Uh, this type of bound principle, also on Weierstrass, and the monotone and Cauchy convergence theorems, they all have computable instances whose solutions compute the Jiren jump. Um, and yeah, this is a very nice kind of historical cluster of theorems. So there's this very nice little book by Dedekind on uh, continuity and irrational numbers uh, from, oh dear, 1873 or something. I don't remember exactly. Yes, I think maybe 
anyway, he proves that all of these uh, these four theorems are equivalent. Um, so it's a kind of nice anticipation of reverse mathematics. So he doesn't have like a formal base theory or anything. It's all done informally. But nonetheless, he you know he says, okay, I'm going to give you my version of the least upper bound principle. Then I'm going to show that you can derive all of the standard theorems. Then I'm going to show you that the standard theorems all imply this theorem. Uh, it's very nice. I wish he kind of said a bit more about it. It's a very short little chapter at the end of the book. Um, but in any case, um, I mean, here I'm not talking about the theorems in some kind of general sense of the right standard way of formalizing them. I'm talking about versions of these things formalized in second order arithmetic. Uh, so this is all kind of modulo some sort of coding apparatus. But in any case, um, okay. So that was uh, intuitionistic Church's thesis and constructive mathematics um, and how we can use recursive counterexamples there. But you can also do this for, say, predicative mathematics. Um, of course, then you need something like intuitionistic Church's thesis, right? You need some way of characterizing the, the domain of predicativity such that if uh, some theorem, if, if you can cook up a recursive counterexample such that the um, solution to that counterexample falls outside the relevant domain, then it shows that predicative mathematics can't prove that principle. So here's the standard kind of way of doing that um, due to Kreisel. So the citation here is this Kreisel paper from 1960, La Predicativité, it's in French. Uh, unfortunately, so far, I don't I think there's an English translation. Somebody should really do one. But Kreisel writes various remarks across various papers about this point um, from the late 50s onwards, sort of building on the work that Pliny does on the hyperarithmetical sets. So Kreisel suggests fairly tentatively that predicative definability um, can be uh, equated with hyperarithmeticity. Um, so here's the definition of the hyperarithmetical sets. So we define them by transfinite recursion on omega 1 CK. I'm brushing over all the details, of course. Um, but roughly the idea is that uh, just as in the arithmetical hierarchy, we can think of iterating the Turing jump up finitely many times and get to any um, level of the arithmetical hierarchy. With the hyperarithmetical hierarchy, you reach the top of the arithmetical hierarchy and keep going from the omega jump onwards um, all the way up to omega 1 CK. Um, so, an extension of the uh, arithmetical hierarchy introduced by Pliny. And really, the, maybe there are two remarks here about connecting this to predicativity. And Kreisel mostly talks about one of them. So, Pliny's famous theorem from this 55 paper is the identification of the hyperarithmetical sets with the delta 1, 1 definable sets. And of course, delta 1, 1 means that this is a very stable, robust class of sets. Um, and so if you extend a model um, which contains these sets, then they're not going to be perturbed by it, right? There's a kind of stability idea that Kreisel finds in the writings of Mike and others early on in the, the history of predicativity. And he thinks that this is kind of a motivating idea that shows you why um, you should consider this identification of hyperarithmetical sets with predicatively definable sets. Um, but another natural way of looking at it is just that this is a kind of bottom-up process, right? We start at the bottom with the empty set, and then we add in the recursive sets, and we apply the Turing jump. Turing jump, of course, is a predicative operation because it only quantifies over natural numbers, right? It's just one quantification over natural numbers, in fact. And then you, you get a new collection of sets, right? You get the delta two sets, and then you apply the jump again, and again, and again, okay, finitely many times, and this, then you're always in the arithmetical hierarchy. So this is all still predicative, but then you can just keep going through the constructive ordinals, building up always from below. So that's another way in which we can think of the hyperarithmetical hierarchy as giving us a predicatively definable set of um, sets. 
because it's built up from below in this way. So there's kind of reasons to think that this is at least a reasonably plausible kind of thesis. Um, yeah, I already said all this. Um, so then this is kind of connected with, again, this study of recursive counterexamples, uh, in particular the cantor bendixson theorem. So cantor bendixson theorem is a very standard, famous theorem. Uh, every closed set of real numbers can be given as the union of a perfect set and a countable set. Okay, so, so we can think of this is just meaning that we have this, this nice perfect kernel of this closed set and a few scattered points floating around. Um, and so we can just rub out the scattered parts and just have this perfect set left. A very nice, very nice theorem. Um, and Kreisel has this, so Kreisel says, well, there are two standard ways of proving this, um, and there's one that's more involved, and one there's a kind of shorter way using, I think, maybe the axiom of choice. But this uh, more involved way is nicer because it lets you get a real grip on how complicated these things are in terms of the analytical hierarchy. And what Chrysler showed was that you can have a computable closed set of reals um, such that both the perfect set and the uh, countable set that it's composed of are both pi one one. Right? So it's not just a recursive counterexample, but it's a hyperarithmetical counterexample. Or if you want, accept this identification of hype with the predicatively definable sets, it's a predicative counterexample. So this is a theorem that is impredicative. Uh, Kreisel has some kind of no make remark about this. You know, the, this, this result shows that the cantor bendixson theorem has an impredicative character. They are pi one one, not delta one one. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, he shows that they're not delta one one and not sigma one one either. Okay. So this has kind of given us a flavour for what we're doing with computability theory in analysing different foundations of mathematics. Um, but then. Thinking back to the point at the beginning, uh, computability theory is carried out usually in an informal way, right? We, we don't go around writing down a fixed language or having fixed axioms or fixed inference. Maybe at most you would gesture towards it and say, well, if you like, all of this can be done in ZFC. We can, we can formalize all of this stuff in principle or maybe in some weaker system of second order arithmetic, but you know, Typically, we're just working informally. And we're working with some pretty specific notions. So we take the resources of set theory for granted, more or less. And more problematically, at least from the point of view of the study of foundations, um, we assume that we've got this unique determinate natural number structure over which our computable functions are defined. So we think that you know, we've just got omega, and then we do stuff with it with subsets of it. Um, of course, we also assume that if we've got some computable instance of a classical mathematical theorem, like cantor bendixson uh, then the solution does exist, right? So we don't take Kreisel's theorem to show that um, the cantor bendixson theorem is false. We just take it to show that it's hyperarithmetically false, right? Um, so we're assuming all of this you know, we're just assuming that classical mathematics is true, uh, which is fine from the point of view of computability theory, but more problematic if we want to use it as a way of convincing people that um, who might have some kind of strong foundational view that they're missing out on something like mathematical Bendixson theorem. Um, so, this point, I, I want to say that these considerations taken together suggest that if we want the import of these counterexamples to be accessible to somebody who's a finitist, or a constructivist, or a predicativist, we need to somehow internalize them. We need to take them from the world of computability theory and bring them as far as is possible within a framework that's acceptable to the foundationalist, acceptable from that foundational standpoint, whatever it might happen to be. And of course, the details of that are going to vary depending on what the foundation is. 
Um, so this is going to somehow involve uh, getting rid of these two problematic aspects that, that we take the truth of classical and mathematical principles for granted, and also that we have this um, privileged standard model that we think that we have um, a determinate grasp on. Uh, because it just might not be the case that uh, someone looking out from a foundational perspective will accept that. Uh, certainly, you know, finitist is not going to accept that we can um, say have instances of induction with arbitrary complexity. So we we need to somehow find a way of being much more careful about what we are saying when we try and convey these results. Um, so this is just another way of thinking about it. You know, we're trying to take the reasoning involved in these what are essentially impossibility results and try and make them acceptable from these foundational points of view. So involving only constructive methods or predicative methods or whatever it might be. Uh, so I'm going to propose that reverse mathematics is a way of doing this. OK, so I'm just going to, how much time do I have? Not that much time. OK, I'm going to brush through the technical preliminaries relatively quickly, uh, mainly because they're not that important for this talk. So I just always have a slide like this. I guess everyone does. Um, but anyway, second order arithmetic. It's a two sorted language in our usual signature of arithmetic with 0, 1 plus times less than. And this membership signal symbol. With, so it's a two sorted first order system. Got number variables and set variables. And then um, the structures of this language are just models of arithmetic, but they've got this extra bit here, this second order part. So consider consisting of some subsets of the domain. And then full second order arithmetic is just uh, the axioms of Robinson's Q, or something like it, the A minus, however you want to formulate it, this induction axiom, and a comprehension scheme for four predicates in the language. Okay. And then the important thing for our purposes here is, of course, in reverse mathematics, the subsystems of second order so not the full system, but these weak fragments of it. Um, RCA0, so it's the progressive comprehension axiom. Um, WKL0, which is RCA0 plus weak Koenig's lemma. ACA0, which is RCA0 plus arithmetical comprehension. ATL0, which is arithmetical transfinite recursion. So more or less, we can just iterate the Turing jump along any um, well-ordering, or anything we can prove to be a well-ordering. And pi one comprehension just says any pi one one set exists, um, and this is these systems are all linearly ordered by proof theoretic strength. So that's by inclusion in terms of theorems, not consistency strength. These these two guys actually have the same consistency strength, um, and of course these are all connected intimately to uh, principles to do with computability theory. Um, and to do with the various hierarchies I've mentioned. So, of course, you can read the arithmetical comprehension scheme as just saying that uh, the or of the sets in the arithmetical hierarchy exist, or alternatively, that uh, the Turing jump can always be iterated finitely. Um, ATR0 has this close relationship to the hyper arithmetical hierarchy, although there are some subtleties there that I won't get into. And then pi 1 1 comprehension again is. Uh, we'll see a connection to this cantor bandits theorem. Okay, so this gives us a language that can formalize a lot of uh, ordinary mathematics, so-called. Um, real and complex analysis, to functional analysis too, um, countable algebra, topology of complete separable metric spaces, infinitary combinatorics, logic, etc. So we've seen a few examples, mostly from analysis, some from logic, um, a little bit of descriptive set theory with Cantor Bendixson. Um, now, these are all readily formalized in this language, albeit with perhaps some artificiality in the coding. <coughs> so, roughly, the method of reverse mathematics <coughs> here is to formalize some mathematical theorem as a sentence of this language. So, so far, this is exactly the same as this computability theoretic analysis of a foundation, right? Of, of a whether a theorem is, say, computably true or hyper arithmetically true, right? We, we take um, 
uh, mathematical theorem, we formalize it in this language. So, so far the same. But then the difference is that typically we want to prove it in one of these subsets. Okay, so we want to we want to get an equivalent. We want to get an upper bound and a lower bound for them to coincide. So supposing this is say the Heine Borel theorem or the formalization of it, then we prove it in WKL0. And then we go backwards from the theorem to the axiom, we add the statements to the base theory RCA0, and we prove the axiom. So we take the Heine Borel theorem, we add it to RCA0, and we prove WKL0. Okay. So you get these equivalences, and you get these equivalence classes of theorems going up in proof theoretic strength. Okay, so here in some sense is where the rubber meets the road. Um, these reversals from a theorem to a, an axiom are very closely related to recursive counterexamples. So they can just be thought of as this process of internalization. It's really, you know, we have the recursive counterexample and then we formalize it and that gives us the reversal. So we construct the recursive counterexample within RCA0. So RCA0 has this recursive comprehension axiom that says all of the recursive sets exist, the delta 1 definable ones. So you can just construct, say, the, the set that uh, Kreisel constructs in his uh, recursive counterexample to the cantor bendixson theorem or whatever it might happen to be. Right? Um, so it's a computable instance of this uh, theorem that you're studying. And then you use the principle to generate a solution. So going back to the cantor bendixson theorem, uh, you, you take your computable instance and you, you're working in RCA0 plus cantor bendixson and you use cantor bendixson to generate this solution. Why? Uh, I guess in this case it's going to be a pair of solutions but whatever we can always just join them together using recursive comprehension. Um, so we generate, we've, we've got our computable closed set and we apply cantor bendixson theorem and we get our perfect set and our uh, countable set. And then it just falls out from formalizing the computability theoretic proof of the degree of complexity of that solution within RCA0 that the axiom S is true. So in this case, what you're going to get is that you've got two pi one one complete sets, and so you can then just prove pi one one comprehension um, just by following the appropriate normal form theorem. Um, you might have to prove arithmetical comprehension first. I don't remember how the proof goes, uh, but more or less, this is the idea. You know, you're producing, you're, you're just take, you're really just taking the computability theoretic proof. And you're doing it within this weak formal system. Okay. So, of course, this is exactly what's gone on throughout reverse mathematics. This is kind of like the basic method of producing these reversals. Um, so, a couple of things that I mentioned already. So, Pliny studied the fan theorem in this 52 paper. Um, in this recursive context, led to the definition of weak Kernig's lemma and the equivalence of Gödel's complete theorem to weak Kernig's lemma. Uh, and then to so the uh, cantor bendixson theorem. Uh, I only mentioned this last one because I think it's a nice example, it's outside analysis for once. Um, so Pfefferman has this paper in 75, um, and he shows, he, he, he looks at this result from this uh, book by Kaplansky, I think, um, on infinite abelian groups. and. Uh, so the, theory, the classical theorem is that every countable abelian p group has the largest divisible subgroup. And he shows that this isn't true in the hyperarithmetical sets by, by basically producing a recursive counterexample. So you've got this recursive countable abelian p group, but the largest divisible subgroup is pi 1 1, pi 1 complete. Um, and then you can just formalize this and I think maybe this was done in the early 80s, I think there's a paper by Friedman, Simpson, and Smith. Um, and yeah, you can just formalize this to get pi 1 
uh, and all of these equivalences, at least here, are provable over RCA to zero. So I guess there's something additional that we should say, which is that uh, it doesn't always work as nicely as one might want. Sometimes you need more induction, uh, but a lot of the time it works, and you can just do it all in RCA zero. Okay, so this leads me to a little quick comparison between this sort of more axiomatic approach and the computability theory perspective. Um, so if we work in computability theory, we can get more fine-grained results. So we can work out how many applications of the jump we need. Um, and it's, you know, certain kinds of analyses are just a lot nicer there. But for this kind of purpose, we can think of the reverse mathematics results as being more general, in the sense that we're not just working with the standard model of arithmetic. We're not just looking at omega models. We don't need some external categoricity result delivered by second order logic or by some ambient set theory. Um, we can just work axiomatically in a way that's acceptable to a wide variety of foundational standpoints. So it's kind of obvious that RCA0, for example, is going to be predicatively acceptable. It might take a little bit more work to show that it's finitistically acceptable based on perhaps no conservativity theorem. Um, it's not, I guess, intuitionistically acceptable because it's got excluded middle, and then maybe you want to go to some um, intuitionistic version of it. And that's going to limit to some extent what you can prove, but still, um, you know, you can see that this is this is at least a road to getting these kinds of results. Um, yeah, this I guess I won't really talk about this, but yeah, this this sort of idea of connecting multiple models via an axiomatic theory is something that Kreisel talks about. And I think probably this had an influence on uh, Friedman, his development of robust mathematics. Um, yeah, so this, again, is just this point that uh, RCA0 is sufficiently weak that it's going to be amenable to a lot of uh, foundational theories. Um, you can even, in many cases, weaken it, so you can weaken induction even further uh, and still prove a lot of these equivalences. Okay, so bringing it finally back to uh, the points I was making right at the beginning about Browarian counterexamples. So reverse mathematics by itself doesn't deliver the accessibility, as I call it, of an impossibility result to a given foundation standpoint. So suppose you're a predictivist, and you certainly accept RCA0, ACA0, maybe some more. This means that you can prove the equivalence of the cantor bendixson theorem to pi one one comprehension. And so, you know, you can internalize the computability theoretic result just fine. That doesn't tell you that you can't predictively prove the cantor bendixson theorem. You need something else. You need something that tells you that pi one one comprehension is not predictively acceptable, but it's ruled out in some way. Um, so, these Browarian counterexamples, the weak and strong counterexamples, suggest two responses. Um, one of them is that we could endorse some kind of limitative axiom, and the other is that instead we could adopt an, a an attitude or a disposition of uh, caution, epistemic caution. So a limitative axiom is something like ICT or V equals L, right? So we're just ruling stuff out by fiat. We're going to adopt an axiom that says certain things don't exist. You know, only the constructible sets exist. Only the computable functions um, exist. And this makes it very easy, right? So if you have an axiom that says that certain things don't exist, then, well, you, you prove that cantor bendixson implies I one one comprehension, say, you know, an axiom that says uh, that at least certain instances of pi one one comprehension are disallowed, um, then uh, you, you can just prove that this is false, right? Predictive false. Um, so that's one way. The other way is to just adopt this kind of attitude. So unlike in criminal law, here we're going to adopt the attitude that mathematical theorems are guilty until proven innocent. So if you go and you know go on Google Scholar and you search for a constructive proof of, I did this earlier, you get many results 
and, and this is precisely the kind of attitude that I'm talking about when I talk about epistemic caution. So the idea is just, um, I'm a constructivist. I want to know whether some theorem is provable or not. Well, I'm just going to go and try and find a constructive proof of it. But until I can prove it constructively, I don't accept the theorem. Uh, so it's, you know, it's considered guilty until proven innocent. Um, and this, this corresponds to this Brauerian weak counterexample, whereas the limitative axioms, these are corresponding to Brauer's strong counterexample. So I think these are more or less the two options that are on the table. I mean, if anyone comes up with others, I'd be very interested to hear. I think, broadly speaking, these are the obvious ones. Um, and of course, which of these particular approaches is appropriate is going to depend on the foundational standpoint in question and what uh, conceptual resources, uh, what principles that foundation motivates. Okay, so I've been talking for over an hour, so I think I'm going to stop now. But I have a couple more slides that I can go into if there are a few questions. Maybe I'll stop for them.